It's time for Football at Four with Jeff Mosier. My personality is I, I want to win badly. I want to win more Lombardies for Philadelphia and our fans. we got the greatest fans around, and I will do everything possible. Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios. This is Football at Four. All right, Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. And it's brought to you this hour by Prop Swap, America's sports betting marketplace. Sell your sports bet, take your profit, find out how at PropSwap.com or download the Prop Swap app today. All right, a lot to dive into on this Football at Four Wednesday edition. Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast. I don't see Jeff Mosher. I just kind of see an outline of Jeff Mosher. You appear to be uh, just an outline of yourself. What's going on, man? That is some terrible lighting right there. I tell you, I had to move to a different room, and I thought sitting in front of the window was going to be helpful for lighting, but that that's pretty bad, isn't it? Yeah, I can't. There you like go. A, You're a just that. How, how about – let me see what I can do here. <laughs> I mean, for the people listening, they're like, who cares? I can barely see you. But yeah. the people watching, they, I look like. People uh, listening are like, I can't see you at all. What's that? The people listening say, I can't see you at all. Yeah, seriously. It's like the old Alfred Hitchcock uh, trailer there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, go ahead and ask away, and I'll, and I'll figure out something. Uh, all right. Well, uh, don't don't kill yourself over there. All right. Uh, Jeff yeah. Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast is with us here on the Sports Bash uh, Football at Four. All right. So a couple of things uh, that we want to get into here. Uh, this The whole Zach Ertz thing, I think. Do you think that the Ertz story will be written by the end of the week here? It's very possible. Um, it doesn't have to be, but I think it, it, it could possibly be written by the end of the week. Um, I did speak to one team that had interest at one point in Zach Ertz and asked if there was any movement because it was after June 1st. And the answer I got was not much. So uh, that, that tells you right there that things are are still not exactly press progressing quickly, at least as far as I asked, but I still don't think Mikey's going to be on the team when the season starts. I know Howie Roseman has said uh, that he's a good player, that they're better off with Zach Ertz if they need to be, but you cannot, I believe, in my opinion, this is a very cross, I mean, a very important year for Dallas Goddard. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a minute. Fourth year, he is tight end one. You have to find out if he's going to be healthy. And he, he, he's also already talking about contract extensions. You can't have both these guys on the team and put the coaches in the position where they have to almost take a good player and put them on the, on the bench because they want to play a different t- type of personnel. That's just ugly and, and not necessary kind of went through that a little bit last year with having Alshon on the team, even though the team didn't want him there. So I cannot, I cannot imagine that he's really going to be on this team. Uh, you mentioned that you talked – you said they wouldn't budge. You're talking about the Eagles wouldn't budge. They wouldn't budge off what they're asking for? No, oh, no. It's just that uh, I think it's more Zach's um, salary that teams are going to want to, you know, either renegotiate, restructure, maybe take – maybe ask him to take a pay cut because they don't think he's, you know, worth what his contract says it is worth. And so uh, in that regard, Zach has to be, I, I would think, amenable to it, and I'm not sure that he is right now. Uh, today, Dallas Goddard on a Zoom call said that the contract, uh, he's had contract extension talks uh, with the Eagles, and that, uh, you know, that's interesting because he says he'd love to stay in Philadelphia and get the extension done, but he's also one year away, away from free agency. So uh, is he kind of weighing uh, the options here? Imagine having Dallas Goddard and Zach Ertz in 2019 and having neither of them in 2000. Oh, no, this is 2020 and then neither in 2022, right? That's how fast things can change in the NFL. But I suspect that the Eagles will get something done with um, Dallas Goddard because, again, they're going to move forward with him. He has shown when healthy that he is a very good tight end and could possibly be a top five tight end in the league. He has those type of abilities. He catches the ball very well. He has explosion after the catch. Really, the only thing he hasn't shown is durability. You know, the ability to play 16 games and be productive in every single game. Uh, he's had a lot of injuries along the way. So, obviously, that's a big question mark. And, and you notice that the Eagles have stockpiled a lot of kind of what I would call project-like tight ends. I mean, the kid from Buffalo, Tyree Jackson, who was a quarterback, is, is you know, going to attempt to transition to tight end. They brought in. Last year, Jason Kroom, they brought in Hakeem, um, uh, his last name Butler. escapes me. Butler, is it? Yes. What is it? Butler. Yeah, Butler. Right. So, um, 
They the kid that they signed, Mike, out of Nebraska, Jake Stoll, is definitely a name to watch. If you remember last year, they signed a rookie free agent. His name was um, Noah Togiai, mm-hmm. and they really liked him. And shot, you know, they tried. To, we we talked about this. They tried to pass him through waivers so they can put him on the practice squad, and they were just blindsided, up. right, when the Colts Colts picked him up. So I'm guessing they won't make that same mistake this year around if Jack Stoll continues to be one of those guys that they really think. Uh, can be an NFL tight end and a good developmental tight end. Well, I was going to say, uh, we touched on this with uh, Andrew a little bit yesterday, but uh, because of, you know, Ertz looking like he won't be here and then you're working on a contract extension with Goddard, you don't have, like, for this year, that depth chart looks uh, pretty unsettled. It almost appears like Darius Slay and the other cornerback. You got Goddard, and if, if Ertz isn't here, what do you got? Yeah, you know, my favorite guy is still out there, and that's Richard Rodgers. I thought, you know, Sort of tongue-in-cheek, he was their most productive tight end last year, only because Carson seemed to only be able to throw completed passes to him and him only. You remember that Giants game where he basically caught, like, half of Carson Wentz's completions. So uh, he's a guy who fits the offense well. Well, I assume uh, fits Nick Sirianni's offense well. Can block, can catch, is a good veteran number two. He's still out there. Isn't Trey Burton, uh, as, as we speak right now, still out there? I believe so. Yeah, and he's got experience. So, I mean, the Eagles don't have to panic here. I know they didn't drafting a kid but you usually keep three um goddard will be one stall will have a chance to be the number three guy as a developmental rookie free agent and then your backup uh, it could it may just not be here or it may be a guy like Kroom or someone else who, who has a good camp jeff yesterday was june 1st and that is a big day in the nfl how did it affect the eagles with uh, some of the things that they now will do moving forward uh just cleared up a little more cap space because of the contracts with Malik Jackson and Alshon Jeffrey. Some of the money that they would have had to absorb this year now goes into next year. So um, it's, it goes against next year's cap, which isn't an ideal thing, but it is now because the Eagles need cap space. They need to be able to pay rookies. Um, they need, build, need to be able to potentially afford uh, a number two cornerback like a Steven Nelson or anybody else who might be out there. And of course, if they still want to make any trade and, we know Julio Jones is named out there, and then there is a, a, a degree of interest in him from the Eagles. Um, obviously need some space there, so they need to have uh, flexibility. All right. Well, you just mentioned the Julio Jones thing. I want to ask you something about that. Uh, there are betting odds on this. Typically, the Eagles' odds are always going to be good. I feel like betting places know that Eagle fans are suckers. <laughs> but are you surprised that the Eagles are high on that list? I mean, right now the favorite is Seattle, then Tennessee, Philadelphia's third. I mean, it's plus 225 Seattle, plus 250 Tennessee, plus 275 Philadelphia. Yeah, well, I'm not surprised only because of what you mentioned about how Vegas views, you know, fan bases, interest, media reports fuel into it. And certainly the Eagles have been linked to Julio Jones. I don't know that it's it makes the most sense. I mean, I mean, of course it makes the Eagles better. I think there's no question about it. Um, gives them a lot of flexibility now with if you had Julio Jones and where are you going to put Devontae Smith, you'll probably hit um, mix and match Devontae and Jalen Rager at the Y and the Z a lot. And, um, you know, Dallas Goddard will be a flex guy a lot. So you'll have some some pretty good weaponry there along with Miles Sanders. And it really would cast into doubt some of the wide receivers that we talked about last year and whether they're going to be on the team, like a high tower or a Watkins, things like that. I, you know, it makes the team better because it makes any team better to have Julio Jones. Is, is it, is it's not get, necessarily the if, their if biggest they went need. After Mo, uh, Mo, if they went after Julio Jones, does mm-hmm. that tell you that their mindset is we're good enough to, I don't want to say win the Super Bowl, but Hey, we got Julio Jones. We're good enough to win this division. Yeah, I think that's that's what they do anyway, most cases, right? Yes, there have been some um, times, like in the last few years, where Howie said he's made certain moves because he felt the window was still open after winning the Super Bowl to win another. Right now, I feel like Howie is just simply trying to field the most competitive team possible while still turning the roster over, and you can do that. You can bring in Julio Jones and look at your wide receiver group and say, I've still got the future here in Devontae Smith, in Jalen Rager, in maybe a Watkins or a Hightower or Greg Ward or somebody else who I've drafted and developed. So it doesn't preclude him. Uh, People talk about taking snaps away. You know, you're still going to get those guys on the field a lot, Rager and Smith. I don't think it it hurts, but you can't be in the camp of saying, I want Jalen Hurts to succeed and 
I want to see what he can do this year and then not be in the camp of, but he doesn't need a Julio Joe. You want him to have a great offensive line. You want him to have great weapons because the best chance he has to succeed is to have that. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's why, okay. So I, I, I heard today, you know, there was reports, oh, that uh, they don't think that they're looking, no one is willing to give up a first round pick in the next draft coming up, but uh, maybe a future first, uh, but the best offer they've been kind of getting right now is like a third. I mean, I'd probably do it for a third, but are you giving up a first round pick for Jones? Not unless I absolutely have to. And then if I have to, you know, you're asking me if I would do it. Is, it, I important don't know the though, do, is it important enough to you, Mosh, to get a guy like Jones around Devonta Smith and Jalen Rager and, and Hertz? Yeah, I think, but at the end of the day, it's still also about value. Yes. You, you consider that when you're making the trade about the benefits that it will have for your team. Um, I would, Adam Kaplan brought this up on our last podcast. I think it was a really fair assessment that you give up a first, but not a clean first. In other words, you might get Julio and a third back or Julio and a fourth or make something conditional. So that you're not just totally giving up a first round pick. You're getting something in return. That to me seems likeliest to happen is that, yeah, you might give up a first, but Atlanta's not just getting that. They're going to have to give up something along with Julio because obviously you're taking that contract too. Yeah, I know Adam has said that uh, that uh, the Falcons aren't getting what they want in this deal yet, so that's why they uh, are not going to pull the trigger. They're kind of well. The nobody Eagles. ever gets what they want, right? The Eagles aren't getting what they want for Zach Ertz, and I'm sure the Packers will never get what they want for Aaron Rodgers. That's because teams, when you have stars, it just it it hurts to like have to part with them, you know, and, well, and you saying, never feel like you're getting value. And the Eagles are similarly in the same place. They're not getting what they want for Zach Ertz either. Now. If they were to move Zach Ertz, Mosh, they will open up more cap space. What would they then do with said cap space? Sign rookies, one, which it doesn't have to be all of them because you only have to be responsible for the top 51, right, on your on your uh, entire 90-man right now. I think that's what it's at. And, um, you know, some of the rookies will will fall into the, the bo- out, outside the 51. But you do need money to sign rookies, although they do have some right now. Uh, obviously, if you're talking contract extensions with certain players uh, who are in rookie deals, like a Dallas Goddard, uh, potentially a Jordan Mailata, potentially a Josh Sweat, I'm thinking of guys who have already played three years and are eligible, those aren't the type of guys who you get get lower cap numbers, right? Because they have low cap numbers right now to begin with. So when you give them an extension, their cap number raises. You need money to be able to give to them. Derek Barnett is a guy who is on his rookie deal, but because the number is so exorbitant on the fifth-year option at $10 million, he possibly could get a lower cap number in year one by getting an extension. But for the most part, the three other guys I mentioned, their cap numbers would probably go up yeah. because of an extension. And I guess uh, you could say, hey, well, now they have room to target a upgrade at corner. I, I saw uh, – I forget who it was who did – it might have been CBS Sports did um, – the uh, corner top, I don't know, the pro football focus, I think, is doing their top 30 for entering the season of each mm-hmm. position. They had Steven Nelson as the 13th best corner, and they had Slay at, like, 25th. So they were essentially saying if you brought Nelson in here, he'd be your best guy. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with those rankings. I'm going to just – I'll say that right now. Uh, I've talked to two or three teams about Steven Nelson, uh, including team that he's played for. Um and they view him as a solid number two, number three type corner. A guy who um, at times kind of talks like he's better than he really is. So That's pretty important in that position, he would though, be right? The, he would be the, the second best corner on the Eagles by far. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's any doubting that, but I'm not ready to put him ahead of Darius Slay. I thought those, you know, and, and look. PFF puts out their stuff. It's a lot of off-season stuff to just kind of build content and get people talking, which they do a good job of. Um, but if you look at it, you would think, you know, Jason Kelsey, number five center in football. Lane Johnson, number 10 tackle. Um, mm-hmm. Brandon Brooks, top 10 offensive guard. I think uh, uh, I think Sayamala was even in the top 30. You you have everybody on the line is one of the best players in the in the league. Fletcher Cox and Javon Hargrave are top 20 at their positions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brandon Graham came in at number 14 at his spot. So apparently they think there's better talent than maybe some of the fans do. Uh, That's possible. You know, I wrote back in February, 
that the offensive line and defensive line have has talent on it. A lot of it wasn't healthy last year. But usually when you're good in the trenches, you can compete in games. And then it kind of comes down to um, how good does your quarterback play and how good is your coaching. So the, the Eagles are strong in the trenches theoretically. When you talk about rankings, I would ask, well, where was Carson Wentz ranked last year going into the year quarterbacks? Probably top 10, top 11. You know, he had just went 4-0 and in December and then got hurt in Seattle. Um, but you know, people had pretty good vibes about what he did in December. I don't think anybody had him ranked as the 28th best quarterback yeah. in the NFL, but that's probably what he was last year. Maybe even lower than he might've been 30, 31. I, I haven't seen like, I'm not going on any specific rankings, but the bottom line is that's the thing with these rankings. You just never know. All right. Now on that note, uh, we were, I was, um, Anthony Harris, who they signed at safety in the off season, was also written that that was one of the best upgrades for any position in football last year, bringing Harrison to replace Mills. So I was kind of like, you know, I feel like the Harris thing is kind of iffy because he last year. Now, last year's interesting. He had 104 tackles, no picks. The year before, he had all these interceptions and very little tackles. So he's a tough guy, but apparently he's considered a pretty – a uh, high-level upgrade over what you had the year before. Wait, did you say the best upgrade no, in football? They uh, did, somebody rated? They, they did the top 20 upgrades. In other words, this guy replaced uh-huh. him. Right. He, you know, like J.J. Watt replacing this guy, that was the best upgrade in football. Okay. So Anthony Harris replacing Jalen Mills made the list of the best upgrades for a team. Oh, okay. Made the list. I thought you said was the best upgrade. I was like, wow, that that's <laughs> that would be I crazy. finished number eighteen on the list of all the of all the upgrades. <laughs> uh, that that's that's pretty good. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Listen. It, it, obviously, you're playing a whole different coverage here and a whole different scheme. And Anthony Harris has played in that scheme and started in that scheme and done a nice job in that scheme. I don't want to. I don't want to. You know overthink it here. I mean, he got his job because somebody else got hurt. They're, they're be- or, or when they were in their heyday as a defense, the Vikings, their their defense was Andrew Sandejo. Their safeties were Andrew Sandejo and Harrison Smith. And Anthony Harris got a chance to move in there after some guys got hurt, and he played well, well enough to start, but he didn't get a long-term deal from the Vikings after getting the franchise tag, and he didn't get anything more than a one-year deal from the Eagles. So I don't want to sit here and talk like we, yeah. we went through this last year with Will Parks, to be honest, True. where a lot of people got very, very excited about Will Parks's potential and Jim Schwartz's defense and, you know, took a discount and yada, yada, yada. And he didn't even make it through the whole year. So I, I trust me. I think that Anthony was a bizarre Harris situation gonna, too. Yes, it was. I, I think Anthony Harris is going to be a good upgrade. I think he's, he's perfect. He'll make it through the year and hopefully he'll play well enough to earn an extension, but I, I don't want to, you know, treat this like this is a, uh, the same as, um, you know, getting T.O. to replace Todd Pinkston or something. Yeah. And it's not- in your, uh, by the way, just on a completely different note because we're running out of time here, in your football history of covering NFL athletes with a meniscus tear, how long are they typically out for? Oh, yeah, that's an interesting one because of the Embiid situation. So there's all types, and it's it's different for different positions in football. You, I've seen some offensive linemen either play through it or um, have a procedure and be back in two weeks. I think Todd Harriman's was back basically in two weeks after a, a minor meniscus surgery, and one week was the bye week, so only missed like one game. But these guys just are, are – they go back and forth and back and forth. There's not a lot of lateral movement all the time, and they can kind of play through that kind of pain like Joel. I mean, he's so agile, and all of his game is his Euro step and his cutting to the basket. It's It's hard for me to think that if he has a – even a, a slightly significant meniscus tear that he can play the same way. I think he can play, Mike, right? I mean, you can play through the pain. You might make it worse, though. You certainly can make a small tear into a bigger tear. But how do you get Joel to be Joel when he can't do some of those things? I, that's where I think it becomes really difficult. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and look, even if he misses a week or two, are you getting the same Joel Embiid when he comes back? Probably right. not. And we've seen this uh, – we've seen this – play before all right yeah it's a shame jeff mosher at uh jeff mosher nfl the inside the birds podcast drops tomorrow morning at 6 a.m and of course all the stuff on the inside the birds platform good q a this week uh he's got some good stuff up over at inside the birds.com all right mosh i'll talk to you pal all right thanks man and adam kaplan is in tomorrow
as uh, we will continue our look at the Eagles offseason 